At Tindari, on the northern coast of Sicily, the sea has piled up sand and created a lagoon. The emerged bank's rounded shapes calls to mind, more or less depending on the year, a Madonna and child. Several kilometers to the north, the Mediterranean Sea rolls onto the black sands of the island of Stromboli. The Mediterranean Basin is a perfect example of the extraordinary diversity of European coasts. Despite the fact that the Mediterranean is practically enclosed, has hardly any tides, few storms, is almost monotonous, its coasts abound in sunny landscapes that are not only beautiful, but also full of contrasts. In other climes, other seas wash the shores of the European continent, seas that are colder, less peaceful. The Atlantic Ocean, Baltic Sea, Black Sea, North Sea, English Channel and Norwegian Sea, each touches the old world in its own fashion. This fjord and its incomparable setting were created in Norway when a glacier retreated and the seas advanced deeply inland. A plateau sheared off over the North Sea reveals magnificent limestone cliffs. In Portugal, the ocean's erosive action has crafted this jewel of a coastline the renowned Algarve coast. The spectacle continues with infinite variations along tens of thousands of kilometers of coasts on the European continent. Corsica alone has over 1,000 kilometers of coast. Located in the heart of the western Mediterranean, Corsica is, with Sicily and Sardinia, one of the largest islands in this part of the world. It's 180 kilometers long and 80 kilometers wide. Unlike its sister islands, Corsica is a veritable mountain. A series of granite peaks near the sea make the island's western coastline highly irregular and form deep gulfs. Corsica's climate is exceptional not only because it is very sunny, but it also has abundant rainfall brought by brief downpours. So there's water everywhere on the island, a multitude of stunning creeks and streams and about 40 rivers. The island's water resources account for its lush vegetation. Corsica's geological structure is complex, and this means that the island has an uncommon range of landscapes. The variety, color, and shape of its rock formations make them one of Corsica's major attractions. These formations are why Corsica has been so rightly called the Isle of Beauty. It was on this enchanted island that, before I had a mill, I occasionally went to be alone when I needed fresh air and solitude. What did I do? When the Mistral or the Tramontana winds weren't blowing too hard, 
I would settle myself down between two rocks at the water's edge and might stay there almost the entire day in that kind of stupor and delicious despondency that comes of contemplating the sea. Writer Alphonse Daudet could continue his contemplations here forever and never risk getting bored. Corsica has managed to preserve many of its coasts. Although we're inevitably attracted to them today, there was a time when it was best to avoid these shores and beaches. Across the sea could come danger, misfortune, pirates or invaders. The Corsicans often preferred settling in the mountains, where life was harder, but all told much safer. There are a good number of towers left from the time when the islanders anxiously scanned the horizon on the lookout for the next invasion. They made it possible to keep an eye on these little traveled and dangerous seas. Signals were used to communicate between the towers and warn neighboring villages of approaching enemies. Most of the towers were built in the 16th century. Not all of them have been maintained in good repair, but all of them are located in exceptional spots. This small fort was built by the Genoese in 1546 on the Gulf of Girolata. This magnificent spot is a nature reserve. It's the seaside border of the Corsican Regional Wildlife Preserve. This beautiful granite formation is a vestige of an ancient time when there was volcanic activity on Corsica. This magnificent beach, fringed by a splendid pine forest, stretches for six kilometers along one of the most beautiful spots in Corsica, the Gulf of Calvi. Man lived on the shores of the Gulf in prehistoric times. It got its current name in the 13th century during a feudal war. One of the warring lords was entrenched on a completely bare rock. The rock became known as Calvus, or bald in Latin. The gulf stretches from the point of Revelata to the point of Spano and is separated into two distinct bays by a granite promontory where a citadel was built. This little city, where some people claim Christopher Columbus was born, is one of the most charming towns in Corsica. It was built in the 13th century. The city is divided into two distinct districts, a citadela, the upper town, and Uborgu, the port. The port and citadel have always been integral parts of Calvi, which adopted its motto in the 16th century, Calvi Semper Fidelis, or Calvi Always Faithful. The citadel symbolizes the city's faithfulness to the Republic of Genoa, which ruled the island for over six centuries. The dense, high-walled citadel was begun in the 13th century, then heavily fortified in the 15th century. The work was commissioned and financed by a group of Genoese bankers, Il Banco di San Giorgio. The citadel is the heart of the Genoese city. Several well-preserved buildings in the maze of charming tiny streets show how important this fortified city was in the Middle Ages. Today, a marina, in other words the port, is a favorite spot for summer vacationers. It is located just at the foot of the citadel. With its docks and palm trees and multitude of yachts and pleasure boats, it's one of the most agreeable spots in Calvi for a stroll. But the beaches and inlets on the Corsican coastline have still other beauties and surprises in store for us. This beautiful white sand beach is located about 20 kilometers south of Sartén. The Gulf of Roccapina is renowned for its pink granite formations. These handsome natural sculptures seem almost perfectly crowned by this magnificent lion high above sea level and carved out by the action of wind erosion. It's said this lion was supposed to guard the tower of Roccapina when partisans and opponents of the Republic of Genoa battled in the 15th century.
Here we found a curious bay with mountain walls of stone to left and right, and reaching far inland, a narrow entrance opening from the sea where cliffs converge as if to touch and close. This description from Book 10 of the Odyssey corresponds so well to this spot that it's thought to have been the source of Homer's inspiration. This ria is 150 meters wide and commonly known here as the bottleneck. It reaches for almost two kilometers into the southern tip of Corsica and leads to the port of Bonifacio. Bonifacio is an extraordinary spot. Its marine, an incredibly well-sheltered natural port, is even more remarkable than that at Calvi, and its upper city is nestled behind protective ramparts. Perched high on a formidable promontory, the citadel encloses an entire portion of the peninsula. It is located on the site of an ancient city and built by the Genoese in the 13th century. The city is thought to be named after Bonifaz, Marquis of Tuscany, who is said to have founded the city in the 9th century. Before this time, the spot was called Giola and a haven for pirates. Sailing from the bottleneck were only 12 kilometers from the large neighboring island of Sardinia. The little Corsican town gives its name to these straits, which are called the inlets of Bonifacio. One has the best view of this extraordinary sight from the sea. While the rest of the island is primarily composed of crystalline rock, the plateau of Bonifacio is over 120 meters thick and composed of horizontal layers of limestone. The cliffs are 65 meters high. At the base, the sea has eroded away the extremely friable limestone. This lone, gigantic rock, a result of the process of erosion, is paradoxically known as the grain of sand. The sea is not the only force that sculpts the cliffs. These spectacular stairs were carved directly into the cliff face. They are called the Stairs of the King of Aragon. With 187 steps, they link the upper city to the sea. According to legend, they were carved in a single night during the siege of 1420. Despite the erosion caused by the sea and the fact that the rock mass is slowly diminishing, these multi-story homes were built right over the cliff face. On the far white mountain, one sees a group of homes lying like an even whiter spot. They resemble wild birds' nests, hanging so on the rock. The homes of Bonifacio fascinated writer Guy de Maupassant. How can one resist the spectacular charms of this little city perched high on the cliffs? The Mediterranean is not the only place one can appreciate this spectacular contrast of limestone cliffs and marvelous seas. 1,500 kilometers to the north, the eastern shore of the little island of Moon suddenly drops away. The cliffs of Moon stretch for almost 8 kilometers, creating a stunning white backdrop for the turquoise waters of the Baltic Sea. Rising about 100 meters out of the sea, these cliffs are part of a very ancient chalk deposited, formed 75 million years ago at the bottom of the deep, calm sea that covered Denmark at that time. Later, movement in the Earth's crust lifted the chalk deposit from the sea floor, and it underwent glacial erosion. Today, the sea eats away at the chalk constantly. Erosion is spectacular. In 1905, 1914, 1952, and 1980, huge portions of the cliff face collapsed into the sea. On January 13, 1988, Sommerspiret, the most famous spot on the huge natural wall, crumbled away and disappeared forever. The cliffs are receding. 
The shoreline is fringed by a beautiful flint cliff, polished by the waves. Overhead, a forest of beech trees grows up to the very edge of the cliff. The coastline of this little 216 square kilometer island is not formed only of cliffs. Beautiful sand beaches and long ranges of dunes can be found on the Baltic shores. The tides in the Baltic Sea are weak, and the seawater contains relatively little salt because the many rivers that drain into the Baltic constantly replenish it with fresh water. This means it abounds in marine nutrients and plankton and is a perfect environment for hundreds of species of fish. A local chronicle dating from 1326 reports that herring were so abundant around the island of Mun that you could fish with your bare hands. Even though these shores are among the most charming on the entire Baltic coast, they have remained literally untouched by tourists. On the island of Mun, man and nature live together in wonderful harmony. The coast of Mön is a refuge for ducks, waders, and birds of all kinds who flock here from the farthest regions of northern Europe to winter in the island's relatively warm climate. Birds set up housekeeping on the shores of the Baltic or in the vast coastal plains in the north of Denmark, Germany, Holland and Belgium. Tidal phenomena on these low-lying coastlines are spectacular. At low tide, the receding waves expose huge areas of fine sand beaches, probably the longest and most beautiful beaches in Europe. Along the straits that separate France and England, at the edge of the English Channel in the North Sea, rise the high cliffs of Cap Blanc-Nez. These cliffs are about 100 meters in height and composed of a type of chalk that is actually rather solid, but is weakened by the rainwater seeping down from the plateau. Rock falls are common, and with each one the cliffs recede a bit more. Here the sea is not responsible for the process of erosion, it just clears away the rubble. These sheer cliffs have their counterparts on the other side of the channel. Upon approaching the English coast, as the Norman invaders once did, one first sees a long, blinding, white band. The cliffs of Dover look like they're sliced out of a huge cake dating from the Cretaceous period. It was these incredibly white cliffs that earned England the name Albion, a name derived from the word Alba, which in Latin means white. On the other side of the channel, there's an almost identical chalk wall. But several kilometers of the face of the cliff are so unique that they have made this coastline famous worldwide. 
For many years, Etretat was nothing more than a small fishing village. Today, there's only one fishing boat left, manned by the last of the village's fishermen. Etretat has become one of the most renowned sea resorts on the coast of Normandy. Etretat's most remarkable feature is its long chain of pebble beaches and sheer cliffs, all separated by jutting arms of land in which the sea has carved out a series of gigantic natural arches. The walls of the cliffs reach a height of 90 meters. The upper rim is slightly furrowed and overhangs the beach a bit because the sea has dug a deep trench at the bottom. High tide, twice a day, brings the sea into contact with the cliffs, covering the beaches and isolating each feature. It is usually a good idea to check the times of tides before setting out on a long walk. To the south, the chalk arm reaching into the sea is massive and intact. This is Courtine Point. Sailing toward the north, we slowly discover the arches that have made Etretat famous. Manport is gigantic, 82 meters high. It rivals with the Aval Arch. Here one can sail under the arch only when the tides are highest. Another arch nearby has collapsed, creating a 70 meter high needle, one of the most well-known formations on the coast. The sea-battered Amont Arch to the north is heftier. 39 meters high, it marks the northern limit of the Etretat arches. The cliffs of Amont were the setting for an unusual ceremony in 1884. That year, an Indian prince died suddenly while visiting Etretat. Hindu ritual required that he be cremated immediately, but cremation was not legal in France at the time. In order to avoid a diplomatic incident, the French government authorized the prince's family to discreetly build a bonfire on the pebble beach at the foot of the cliffs. At nightfall, the prince's remains were set aflame at a spot just meters from the sea. American painter Henry Bacon witnessed the secret cremation, as did French writer Guy de Maupassant. Innumerable famous figures in art and literature have been inspired by Etretat's superb coastline. French writer Maurice Leblanc was a frequent visitor to Etretat, and made it the setting of one of his detective novels starring Arsène Lupin. Forty or fifty meters from that impressive arch known as the Aval that stretches from the upper edge of the cliff like the enormous branch of a tree reaching out to take root in the underwater rocks, there is a limestone cone. This cone is nothing more than the tip of a rock sitting like a pointed cap over a vacuum. The needle of Etretat is hollow and it would become the fabled hideout of the novel's hero, Arsène Lupin, the gentleman burglar. Actually, Lupin's discovery is entirely fictional. But does it matter if it's only imaginary? Maurice Leblanc's description of the hollow needle is so wonderful, it seems almost real. An enormous rock, over 80 meters high, a colossal obelisk, sits upon a granite base, wide at water level and tapering up to a peak like the tooth of a gigantic sea monster. White like the cliffs, a dirty gray-white, the frightening monolith was striped with horizontal lines of flint, where one could see how time had worked slowly for centuries, piling the layers of limestone and pebbles one upon the other. The hole was powerful, solid, formidable. It looked like something indestructible against which the furious assaults of waves and storms could do nothing with a sort of finality about it all, imminent, grandiose, despite the high cliff wall that rose above it, immense despite the space in which it stood. 
It said that there was a vast shipbuilding yard at Etretat in 55 BC, when Julius Caesar was preparing his invasion of England. An expedition that came close to catastrophe because the Romans knew nothing about tides. They left their boats on the English beaches just as they were used to doing on the Mediterranean, where there are hardly any tides. In 26 AD, Emperor Tiberius left Rome, but not to move to the British Isles. He chose a small island off the Sorrento Peninsula. Almost 2,000 years later, Isola di Capri is still drawing celebrities. Capri is a small, mountainous island whose highest peak reaches 590 meters. Marina Grande is the main port. Because the island's coastline is so straight, artificial jetties had to be built to protect and organize ship traffic. The island is only six kilometers long and three kilometers wide. It's a natural extension of the Sorrento Peninsula. Here the coastline is steep and dangerous. From its many panoramic viewpoints, one has wonderful views of rocky inlets, points, capes and cliffs. The Farra Leone rocks are an eternal Capri landmark. These gigantic limestone rocks face the waves off Punta di Tragara, southeast of the island. Capri is a true wonderland. The water is so unbelievably blue you almost expect to see mythical sirens frolicking in the surf. However, no one in Capri is really thinking of stuffing their ears with beeswax, as Ulysses sailors did, to avoid hearing the siren's song. Besides, that would mean you couldn't enjoy the singing of the thousands of birds that live on this lush green isle. Malaparte, Norman Douglas, Krupp and Lennon all lived here. There are two small towns on the island. All told, they cover only 13,000 hectares, but they've forever been irreconcilable rivals. Capri, the capital, is the lower city, a jumble of homes and buildings piled together at an altitude of 142 meters. By contrast, Anna Capri, which literally means Upper Capri, spreads out in a luxuriant carpet of parks and gardens at an altitude of 275 meters. The little island of Capri has a sister, the island of Ischia, to the north on the other side of the Bay of Naples. Ischia was occupied by the Greeks as early as the 9th century BC. They called it Monkey Island. Later, many warring peoples tried to seize control of this little bit of heaven on Earth. This ancient volcano covers a surface area of 45 square kilometers, and almost every square centimeter seems to be exploited. The least bit of land is used by the island's 50,000 inhabitants. The Bay of Naples is one of the most famous, and it's said, one of the most beautiful in the world. Painters, musicians, philosophers and writers have praised it, swept away by the romantic beauty of the landmarks in this ancient setting. Actually, this exceptional shoreline extends much beyond the Bay of Naples. To the south, beyond Sorrente, the shores of the Gulf of Salerno are even more beautiful. The village of Positano, perched in the middle of the Amalfitan ledge, is one of the most authentic and prettiest towns one could imagine. The color of the homes stacked regularly up the hillside, the blend of mountains and seaside, all this is typical of villages on the Amalfitan coast. But the charm of Positano, where automobile traffic is prohibited, is unlike anything anywhere. Extremely sharp coastlines protect these shores, which, because of their wonderful climate and beautiful landscapes, are among the most popular in the world. The shores of the Estorel, 
are among the few that remain intact on the French Côte d'Azur. Between Fréjus and Cannes, an almost impenetrable mountain range reaches all the way to the sea. The Esterel range appeared at the end of the tertiary period, and in the quaternary period it underwent violent erosion. Its rugged high slopes have protected the coast at this spot because they make it difficult to build roads, homes and hotels. A road was, however, cut into the ledge. Now it's at least possible to enjoy a view of this magnificent shoreline. The coastline is cut into sandstone and red periphery. It has a multitude of rocky inlets separated by sheer points and is surrounded by brightly colored reefs and islets. Elsewhere along the coastline, the natural landscapes have been altered by development, which does not always respect the beauty of the setting. Surprisingly, the Gulf of Saint-Tropez which attracts thousands of tourists every year, has retained a lot of its original charm. This peninsula on the Moor coast is surrounded by marvelous beaches. When the summer season is over, these shores can be as beautiful in spots as they were centuries ago. By definition, the shore is the spot where land and sea meet, a clear line where the two elements come into contact. But occasionally, the notion of a coastline is more complex. This is the case with the great deltas, where rivers spread out and flood the land with fresh water before flowing into the sea. This marshy region is located in the heart of the Rhone Delta on the Mediterranean. The Camargue covers more than 500 square kilometers half of which is covered by brackish swamplands and saltwater ponds. Nature has composed this landscape in horizontal lines. The land is boggy, the water is fresh and salty, the currents flow on, meet and blend. This is a world in motion. The balance of power between earth and sea is vague. The entire eastern portion of the Camargue is slowly gaining on the sea. In spots, the sands move toward the open sea at a rate of several meters per year. But to the west, where the river trickles out across the delta, the sea is eating away at the coastline. At first glance, these immense plains look monotonous, but the Camargue is worth a second look. You can only appreciate its charm when you understand how unique and incredibly rich this environment is. The Camargue is a complex ecological structure that is of vital importance to wildlife, particularly birds, which one sees everywhere. This highly diverse environment is perfect for the nesting, feeding and breeding of many species. As the seasons change, the nesting summer visitors are replaced by waves of migratory species, increasing the local population. The pink flamingo is the perfect symbol of the Kamal. Without this region, the species would be threatened with extinction because no other spot on the Mediterranean offers such favorable conditions for nesting. These big waders were once migratory. They spent the winter in Africa. Today, almost 10,000 flamingos live in the Camargue. They thrive in these very salty waters and depend upon the constancy of the water level. Both of these factors enable the pink flamingo to find adequate food and safe nesting grounds away from predators and flooding.
Like the flamingo, the Camargue bull symbolizes this extraordinary region. With its black coat, the Camargue bull probably looks much like the ancient auroch. At the beginning of the 19th century, there were only three herds left, numbering less than 600 wild bulls. Today, over 100 breeders raise the traditional Camargue bull with its lyre-shaped horns. little about the ancestry of the Camargue horse. Its coat is black at birth and only becomes white when the animal is several years old. The Camargue's needs are simple. He can get by on a little fresh grass and a few reeds, but he has the stamina and endurance to meet any test. Camargue horsemen know this incredibly sure-footed little horse can be trusted, regardless of the terrain. Wildlife is one of the most important attractions of this marvelous landmark. Located near industry and a high-density tourist region, it's a miracle that it's been saved. Part of the Camargue is now a regional natural park, making it easier to control human impact on this wild area. A wildlife sanctuary has also been created a veritable zoological and botanical reserve which is not open to the public. These measures will hopefully conserve the natural treasures in the Camargue, once known as the daughter of the river and the sea. Of all European countries, France has the most highly varied coasts. This is not only due to the fact that the country has such an extensive coastline, but also to the fact that it borders on three seas and an ocean, each with different characteristics. Brittany alone, on the continent's western edge, is surrounded by the sea on three sides and has 3,000 kilometers of shoreline, not counting its islands. Its jagged coastline is extremely varied. And as the tides change, it offers a surprising series of gently sloping beaches and rugged rock formations. The Miel Beach at Sanka is one of the largest beaches on the entire Emerald Coast, as it's known here. At the bottom of a cove cut into the soft schist, this fine sand beach stretches for almost two kilometers. Sanka is a peninsula with seven different beaches. Nearby, the harmonious Armorican coastline displays its rock formations, capes, islands, inlets, and strands. In the 6th century, a monk called Lunaire and his companions fled Wales when it was invaded by barbarians. They tried to land on the Armorican coast, but as they approached the shore, thick fog arose, preventing them from anchoring. Saint Lunaire drew his sword and assailed the blinding element. Ever since, whenever fishermen are lost in fog or darkness, they call on the saint to wield his great blade. These coasts are home to a multitude of mollusks and shellfish, easy fishing for beachcombers when the tides are low. They too are part of the Brittany landscape, like the flocks and flocks of birds that compete with them for this pittance. Large colonies of aquatic birds have taken up residence on this sheer pink sandstone wall. The 70-meter-high cliffs of Cap Freyel thrust out like the points of a trident into the sea. The Cape has been classified as a nature reserve because of its remarkable plant and animal life. The Brittany coastline is sprinkled with dozens of islands and islets. This one is not far from the continent, but it attracts crowds unlike any other. 
This is a land of pirates, a paradise for artists, and above all, a world of beauty. The climate on Brea Island is almost as mild as that on the Mediterranean, and the vegetation here is luxuriant. Beautiful palms, mimosas, eucalyptus and fig trees shade these rocky landscapes, giving them a particularly poetic charm. Brea is a world unto itself where cars and other motorized vehicles are prohibited. Here one rediscovers what silence means. One can take the time to admire the sights and sounds of nature. It's only 3.5 kilometers from Por Clo, where one sails into the island, and the Pont Lighthouse at its northern tip. Yet, the landscapes in the north are incredibly different. Here, the coastline is barren and rugged. The difference between the northern and southern shores of Brea Island is as great as that between the northern and southern shores of Brittany. This little river flows only a few kilometers to its mouth on the Atlantic. It played an important economic role in antiquity when clay was gathered along its banks. Today, the Ode River is known above all for its beauty. It snakes quietly across the island, then flows into an estuary. This sheltered harbor is home port to many fishing boats and yachts. The Ode flows peacefully into the Atlantic at the little sea resort of Benode. The French poet Guillaume Apollinaire came here in August 1917 to recover from a war injury. He wrote these lines to one of his friends. Benode reminds one of the Côte d'Azur, with its climate, fig trees and clear skies. Here, as in northern Brittany, the tides set the pace of life, particularly for the fishermen. Whether it be deep sea or line fishing or just beachcombing, fishing is the thing. There are magnificent sand beaches around Benode. Musterlin Beach is perhaps the most stunning. In contrast to these sandy plains, Brittany's rocky western coastline is carved into sharp points that jut dramatically out into the Atlantic Ocean. Crozon Peninsula is a huge stone cross over 20 kilometers long and one of the last sanctuaries where the original beauty of these coasts has been preserved. It's one of the wildest and most storm-battered spots on the entire Atlantic coast. Crozon Peninsula drops off into the sea at Penhir Point. This sheer 70-meter wall extends to a group of isolated boulders known as the Pile of Peas. Penhir Point is on the front line of the endless combat between the continent and the sea. But it's a hopeless battle because the rocks are receding, worn away little by little by rain, wind, ice, and the battering of Europe's most powerful tides. A coastline is beautiful because it's alive, because it's the stage for a natural struggle. Shores fascinate us because they bring promise and danger, 
they are synonymous with departure, exodus, return, and discovery. They have always been a setting for important moments in human history. The first chapter of European civilization was written here. This island in the Aegean Sea is 250 kilometers long and between 15 and 60 kilometers wide. It's one of the sunniest and most attractive spots in the Mediterranean basin. These shores were the setting of the adventures of Zeus, Icarus, Theseus and Europa. Many myths begin or end on these borders between land and sea. The Cretan civilization was only able to grow and reach its peak because the Cretans knew how to navigate these seas and because they sought wealth and the finest aspects of life on the Mediterranean shores. They imported obsidian from the islands of Milo and Yali. They established trade routes and cultural contacts with the peoples of Anatolia, Syria, Cyprus, Libya, Egypt, and the Cyclade Islands. 4,000 years ago, Minoan ships sailed from these very shores. Crete's 1,000 kilometer coastline offers a magnificent variety of fabulous landscapes. The beach at the extreme eastern tip of Crete, northeast of Toplu, is fringed with palm trees. It's one of the most beautiful and most stunning spots on the entire island. This exotic beach, with its phoenix palms, borders a little bay that resembles a lagoon. Vai Beach is such a paradise and so popular that it was classified as a protected zone to preserve its beauty. Matala Beach is located on the island's southern coast. The strip of sand on the Gulf of Masara is famous worldwide. It's said that Zeus and Europa made love here. These caves were inhabited in the Neolithic period. In the 1960s, they were occupied and decorated by sun-living hippies. Today, to protect the caves, they've been closed to the public, theoretically. Of all natural landmarks, sea coasts are the most popular and the most endangered. The public's desire to have easy access to these natural spaces and to be able to enjoy them in comfort is all the greater when the spots are as beautiful as these. The splendors of these European coasts cannot hide an important fact. Thousands of kilometers of other shores have been damaged or ruined forever. Let us hope that mankind remains vigilant and concerned so that these fabulous shores will not one day be just a memory. <laughs>